Hello. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum. And I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's Hammer Forum on Dollarocracy with John Nichols and moderated by Ian Masters. Now, unfortunately, our other panelist, Robert McChesney, was struck this afternoon with a terrible case of the flu, so he won't be able to join us, and we wish him a speedy recovery. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Ian Masters. He's going to introduce our guest speaker. Ian is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of The Daily Briefing every Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m., as well as Background Briefing on Sundays at 11 a.m., all on KPFK 90.7 FM. Ian has been a senior fellow at UCLA's Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations and was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia. And all of you for coming tonight to, to learn about the dollarocracy we call our government and how failing an intervention in this election year Money will elect the best Congress that money can buy. We started out with founding fathers who, in spite of the lofty ideals embodied in the Constitution, actually had in mind what the Greeks called a timocracy, the rule of wealth and property, which Jefferson and Washington had an abundance of. But the right to vote for wealthy white property owners only did not sit well with Patrick Henry and George Mason, the intellectual mentor of both Jefferson and Washington. Mason refused to sign the Constitution because it finessed the issue of slavery when it talked of other persons who were counted as three-fifths of a person, an abomination which Mason warned would eventually come back to bite the country, as it did later with the Civil War. Clearly since then we have, we have, have certainly made considerable progress towards a more perfect union, at least politically, if not economically, where the disparity in wealth in what many call the New Gilded Age, has reached such obscene proportions that just one family, the Walmart heirs, the Waltons, have wealth equivalent to the combined wealth of the lower 40% of all Americans. With our economy now looking more like a plutonomy, politically speaking, can we still say we live in a democracy? Or should we accept the harsh reality that our politics are all about money and therefore he who has the most money owns the most politicians. Is it time, dare we say, to use the O word and accept that we are ruled by an oligarchy and that that is our political and social reality? So then, like with Alcoholics Anonymous, having acknowledged the disease, can we proceed to the 12-step cure? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. As our guest tonight uh, lays out in his new book, Dollarocracy, How the Money and Media Election Complex is Destroying America, we must all engage in the intervention that is necessary to take our democracy back. They have the money, we have the numbers, so it should be easy, right? Yes, if everyone voted, but they don't. Maybe half of the population does at best. So can we complain if we get the government we deserve? The race goes to the swiftest, and clearly the richest can buy the swiftest, as in Karl Rove, for example. But let me offer an example of what a simple change to our laws could do. Let's say you could pass a law that makes voting compulsory. Of course, the five conservatives who brought the, us Citizens United and are likely to go further with McCutcheon on this Supreme Court would strike it down on the grounds that it infringes on our right not to vote. But proceeding with this fantasy, let's look at the example of Australia where such a law exists and if you don't vote, you get fined. You can protest with what's called a donkey vote and cast your ballot for Mickey Mouse, but if you don't vote, the fine is about as expensive as a parking ticket in Westwood. But the point is that the law works because over 90% of the population in Australia vote on a regular basis. And the most recent election in Australia defied political convention because a sitting government presiding over a booming economy got voted out. Why? Because the Labour Party, or the Labour government, had shot themselves in the foot so repeatedly that not even the Democrats could snatch such a defeat from the jaws of victory. But the real point is, how did a Conservative Tea Party global warming denying outlier such as the Tony Abbott government win? Because the Liberals, who are in fact the Conservatives, 
ran on a platform of six months fully paid maternity leave for all Australian women, women and in some cases their spouses and significant others. Can you imagine the Republicans running on such a platform here? Or even the Democrats for that matter. But that was the main issue and why did they run on it? Because to win they had to. When everybody votes in a democracy, everyone wins. When few votes, only those who can buy the votes win. And with our increasingly expensive and protracted elections, we have perhaps the world's most successful celebration of the process of democracy, where the science of elections, the inside baseball, the slicing and dicing of the electoral maps, with TV anchors breathlessly staying up late into the night as the predictions of the pollsters, the focus groups and the pundits invariably confirm the triumph of the process to the point the results are almost irrelevant. And who are the real winners in these 10 to $12 billion exercises in game show democracy? The mainstream media. They end up with most of the money that the politicians raise every day as they sell their souls to the point they don't have time left to do the people's business. In what is a massive transfer of money that is first begged for, then bundled, only to soon find that same money begging the media companies for airtime. Every election year, increasingly, the TV networks make out like bandits with more money chasing airtime as the years, months, weeks, then days tick down to that first Tuesday in November. As long as the Murdochs, Redstones and Roberts profit handsomely from our broken electoral system, don't expect them to reform what they have absolutely no incentive to fix. So it's up to you, me and all of us. And without any further to say, let's hear from John Nichols and in a discussion about how money has captured our politics and what we can do to take it back. Let me, just, let me just introduce you, John. John Nichols is the Nation Magazine's Washington correspondent and the associate editor of the Capital Times, a daily newspaper in Madison, Wisconsin. He and Robert McChesney co-authored It's the Media, Stupid and Tragedy and Farce, How the American Media Sells Wars, Spins Elections and Destroys Democracy. He also uh, co-authored with Robert McChesney The Death and Life of American Journalism, the mass media revealed, re the, the media revolution that will begin the world again. Will the last reporter turn out the lights, the collapse of journalism and what we can do to fix it? And he is the co-author with John, uh, with uh, Robert McChesney, who unfortunately is not here, of course, of the new book, Dollarocracy, How, How the Money and Media Election Complex is Destroying America. Ladies and gentlemen, John Nichols, and by the way, they, he'll be signing the book uh, in the lobby when we're done. So, John. Thank you, Ian, uh, who does such a terrific job of basically saying everything I would have said, but now it's all done. I had this huge Australian analysis prepared, but only to have it undermined by my introducer. Uh, Ian, I've appeared on your show uh, a number of times, and it is always an honor uh, and, and also sort of a revelation to be interviewed by somebody who might actually know something uh, because it, it, it is one of the more fascinating things about writing books in America these days is that, you know, there's a book selling industry, right? You go around and there's radio shows you go on and, and uh, you know, you go on a show like Ian's and, and you're actually asked questions about your book, which has been amazingly enough read. Um, but the pinnacle of our last tour for Death and Life uh, of American journalism was we were in a, a, a West Coast city that shall remain nameless. And um, we went at 7 a.m. to be on the, the top rated local AM radio show with a you know, very glib and charming host. And he's literally, we're in the studio and he's sitting there with the press release for the book. And, and he goes, so your new book is about journalism. <laughs> you know, what's up with that? And, and it was just like, it, you realize that the crisis of our discourse in America is that the people who have been given responsibility and who literally get paid day in and day out to maintain at least some sort of vital underpinning for an honest and intelligent discussion don't even bother to show up. And Ian bothers to show up, as does Lila Garrett and a few other folks, and I give them immense credit and my applause. 
so let's let's talk a little bit about. I'm not going to give a big long speech tonight, uh, although I've been, you know, I, I've got my Castro side. I could I could give you the three hour address, but uh, because we have Ian sitting here on the stage, we're going to let him ask some really smart questions and have a little dialogue, and then bring you folks in, which will actually, as both Ian and I know, heighten the quality of the dialogue significantly. But before we go into it, I'm told that I should to give you a little sense of, of the crisis. And one of the theories that I have about, about human beings is that we always like to think we live in the worst of times. You know, that this is, this is as bad as it has ever been. And I actually have people who argue with me. They'll say, oh, it's, 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 there's no way to fix anything. It's, it's a nightmare scenario. Everything has gotten so bad. You know, capitalism has revealed all of its all of its incredible flaws and tentacles. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's just it's, these are lousy times, and they, there couldn't possibly be any ray of light in it. And then an email surfaces from Chris Christie's administration, and and you realize that even in the darkest of times, um, there are there are amazing moments of comeuppance. And and I can't be that upset about a week in which. Chris Christie's having to explain his behaviors, and Liz Cheney is no longer a candidate for the U.S. Senate. You know, there, in that, you should see at least a measure of the possibility uh, of upending, upending the, the conventional wisdom. But the exceptions are unfortunately not the rule. And so more often than not, uh, we live in a society where we have seen the diminishing of the vote to such an extent that it is not merely about whether we show up. Turnout matters, and, and that's a huge issue. I, wanna, I hope we talk about it some more. Uh, and America has staggeringly low voter turnout as compared to countries around the world. We, are, we, we would cut off our foreign aid if, if we weren't the people giving the foreign aid. Um, you know, because you guys just aren't, aren't rising to the basic level here. To give you an example of the significance of this thing, it, it, when you talk about voter turnout in America, that is a lie. It's sort of a lie not unlike when we talk about the unemployment figures. The unemployment figures say, oh, we've got a certain level of unemployment. And what they don't say is, well, yeah, but that doesn't really count the people who've given up looking for jobs. It also doesn't count the people who are so dramatically underemployed that they can't possibly support their family. When you, when you put the real unemployment figure in, instead of being in the you know, 7% range, we're closer to the 13% range. And, and that would suggest a much bigger crisis. It's sort of like, you know, if we, if we don't count everybody who's unemployed, if we don't count the people who are really disastrously and destructively unemployed, folks who you know, literally have no option, it won't look as bad. And so as a result, our society won't, won't feel as much of a need to respond. Well, it's similar with voter turnout. One of the things we do in America is we, we talk about the turnout of registered voters, right? But what about the people who never bothered to register, right? And, and so one of the things you need to do when you talk about electoral participation, and this is very vital to the whole dollarocracy reality, is you have to look at the voting age population of the United States and say, well, what percentage of the voting age population of the United States actually participates in elections? And the interesting thing is that in the very dramatic 2012 election, and it was relatively dramatic because you had the prospect of having Paul Ryan as your vice president of the United States, and we've never had a P90X vice president, but... <laughs> You know, I mean, when you're looking at these prospects, right, it was a relatively serious campaign, and yet only about r r roughly 51% of the voting age population participated. So that means that Barack Obama became the president of the United States in the second term with the support of roughly a quarter, a little over a quarter of the overall American population. And you think, well, that's not overly impressive. You know, Ted Cruz could probably do something with that. Um, except for the fact that the Republicans who have tripped up Barack Obama's administration at many turns, they came to power in a 2010 off-year election. Our turnout goes down dramatically in off-year elections, in which only about 37, 38 percent of the voting age population participated. So the defining election of our time, which was not 2012, it was 2010, because that, again, undermined the ability of, of, 
Obama, the Democrats, it, it, no matter what you think of them, to, to in some manner govern. Um, only about a third of the people in the country actually even participated. And the power afforded to the Republicans came from roughly 18, 19% of the population. So one in five people are guiding this country, just on the turnout level. That's a disastrous scenario. That is a total failure. And I mean, it's a failure of democracy at a fundamental level. And so then you ask yourself, well, why does that happen? Well, the best way to look at it is comparatively. Let's, let's consider a country, you know, one of the things is you could say, well, some countries actually have really good turnout, like Malta. I mean, they just about everybody in Malta votes. And it's a small country, you know, it's, you, know you can find your way to the polls. But the, in, in Malta, they get like 93, 95% turnout. That's very, very good. Um, Belgium gets about 93%. It's mostly out of spite, you know, the French speaking folks versus the, you know, a little, but, they, but they all come vote because it matters. But it, let's compare ourselves to a country that we might compare ourselves to. Let's say Germany. Well, Germany just had the dullest election in German history. I mean, Angela Merkel ran for re-election as chancellor, and everybody knew she was going to win. And the only question was how much she won by and how the other parties arranged, blah, blah, blah. It's a very dull election. And they got a 73% turnout, dramatically higher than our election. And this goes to something Ian was saying. When you have a 73% turnout... Well, this is an interesting dynamic because then that means that Angela Merkel's party, the Christian Democrats, which is an intriguing name in, its, in and of itself, um, but the Christian Democrats are to the left of the American Democrats. This is a conservative party that operates well to the left of the American Democrats on just about every major issue. And you're sort of like, well, how do you get that dynamic? I mean, where, what's, what's, that, what's the underpinning of a dynamic where the right-wing party is to the left of the party that Sean Hannity tells me is socialist? <laughs> well, and how do they get a 73% turnout, which they thought was very, very low? How did Norway at the same time get an 80% turnout with a roughly equally dull election? And the answer is structural. And this is the thing, if I, I'll, I'll, we'll talk more in conversation, but this is the one thing I want to give you that I think is the most important understanding of our politics today. Political parties don't matter a whole lot. Personalities don't matter a whole lot because you can shuffle them around on the table. This is like putting the board game out, you know, on, to have a, a play with your kid on a board game. It's the structure. It's the game itself that matters. And our structures have become devastatingly destructive to democracy. We have established structures that do not encourage people to participate, that in fact encourage them to step to the sidelines. Let me give you a quick comparison with Germany. Again, not to say the Germans do a great job. I think they actually have, my German friends get really mad at me when I make a comparison to Germany. Because they're like, no, 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 we have big problems. We have things we have to fix. Don't make us out to be some sort of perfect you know, situation. And yet, by comparison, imagine this. Why does Germany have a, a much larger turnout? Number one thing that they do, number one thing they do, they don't allow, by, you know, by in any sense that we would understand, they don't allow campaign ads. They don't allow campaign ads. And this is a, this is a thing to understand if you want to understand democracy. Television advertising drives people away from voting. It does not draw them to it. The high spending in elections is antithetical to democratic participation, not encouraging of it. And you say to me, well, Mr. Nichols, how can that be? Because Newt Gingrich says the more you spend on elections, the more people get excited, and the better the theater is. No, because in 2012, and we charted in the book, roughly, well, we said 10 billion was spent. Now it's been revealed that another billion was thrown in. You know, who, who can keep track of the Koch brothers? But but the, the interesting thing is that, that we charted Senate races in critical Senate contests in this country where over 90% of the advertising was negative. Over 90% of the ads were negative. So you're spending 10, 11 billion dollars and most of it 
is to tell people that if they vote, they're going to be voting for somebody horrible, right? You're, you're actually, who you wanted to vote for is an awful person. And we have created a structure that can only be understood if we look at it in the commercial setting. Do you know, in the commercial setting, nobody is going to put an ad on that says the other company is a horrible company, right? Because they're competing on the appeal of their product. They want everybody to consume a lot of the product, and then they want to be more popular. And so you don't see Coca-Cola saying, oh, Pepsi, oh, don't touch that stuff, right? Because if they did, people might, you know, Pepsi might come on and say, well, don't touch Coke. And at the end of the week, nobody would drink either of them. And this is what we do in our democracy. We foster the lie that campaign ads encourage or provide information. They don't. Campaign ads are put on to discourage people from voting. Now, the hope is that you can put on a negative enough ad about your opponent that your people will still vote, but your opponent's people will stand down. This is the equivalent, again, keeping our commercial metaphor, it would be the equivalent of if Coca-Cola came on and they said, look, new ad campaign, we don't really want to have to reveal this, but at Pepsi bottling plants across the United States, late in the evening, employees urinate in the vats. Well, instantaneously, everybody's going to be like, well, you can't lie on television, right? It has to be real. So they've told us this. So I will never, ever touch Pepsi again. And then Coke, you know, then, then Pepsi's got to fight back, right? So Pepsi comes on and they says, forget about the urinating in the bats. Do you know that at the Coke plants all over this country, they, they, they literally let rats loose in the, in the processing. The rats are just, they're, they're defecating throughout the whole thing. It's, it's, it's unbelievable what goes into those cans. As I said, at the end of the week, no one would touch Coke or Pepsi. It would be gone. Everybody would stand down. That's what our $10, 11000000000 billion media election complex does. It literally tells people, the whole thing is such an awful disaster. Everybody is such a bad player that you should just stand down. And interestingly enough, we charted against the U.S. versus German spending. In the, they, Germany had an election just recently. Um, Germany, they spent, per person, $1 for every $32 spent in the United States. So it's roughly one thirty-second, right? And yet they got a because theirs is an off year, there's a Bundestag election that's acting effectively a Congress, they got double our 2010 turnout, spending 134th or 132nd as much. So money doesn't make politics better. Money doesn't do anything to improve politics. And yet, our entire trajectory is to bring more money in. That's number one. Number two, how do you get information about politics in Germany? Or Australia, many other countries. Well, the way you get information is by having a massively funded, multi-tiered, multi-regional, public and community broadcasting system that is not for profit and that seeks to inform people about democracy. We don't do that in America, right? We have the people who are, who are putting the ads on, literally shaving minutes off their newscast, so that they can put more ads on. We do not have a media system that encourages democracy. That's number two. Number three, Germany has a structural election system so that no vote is wasted. And you say, this is an interesting concept. In America, we gerrymander our districts so that in most of this country, going to vote in a congressional year, not a presidential year, remember presidentials nationwide, so you figure somehow you're even though the Electoral College, all that, you're throwing something of value into this mix. In an off-year election, why is our turnout so low? Because people live in congressional districts, legislative districts that are so gerrymandered that they're sure that their vote doesn't matter. In Germany, because they have a multi-tiered system, yes, you live in a district where you cast a vote. You live in a, an area, and that area may be very biased toward one party, but you then cast a second vote for a regional list that is assigned proportionally. And so as a result, if you show up to vote, you're going to cast a vote that matters and you have a very real chance of getting somebody you support into office. What that fosters is a multi-party system in which you actually have choices from the left to the right. 
And not just one party of the center right versus one party of the center left, both incredibly corporate, but a far left wing party, a green party, yes, der Linke, uh, a, a, a far left wing party, a green party, a libertarian party over on this end, and then you know a slightly social democratic party and a slightly, well, more liberal than the Democrats in America, conservative party. So you have this variety of choices and new parties can come in the mix. Okay, all that's good. The last thing they do in Germany, and this is the final place where I'll, I'll play this out. This is what I love. In Germany, they actually think it's a good idea to get people to vote. We don't. We make it hard to vote in America. We vote on Tuesday. Why? There is no logic to that. It is not, notably, in the Constitution of the United States. But we vote on Tuesday. In Germany, they vote on the weekend. It makes sense. They actually give the day off. They make it easy to vote. You don't have to go find a place to register to vote. When you turn 18, wherever you live, you get a piece of mail that says you are registered to vote. And when it comes election time, they send you all the paperwork telling you where to vote. You don't have to track the process down. The process is always trying to encourage you. And this is my favorite fact. In Germany, prison wardens have, as part of their job description, a requirement that they inform prisoners, make sure that they get a lot of information about elections, and to maximize turnout of incarcerated people so that they are not disenfranchised and they can be brought back into the system. Excuse me, that's a country that actually would like to have a high turnout. So, we wrote a book about all this stuff. And it makes a fine holiday gift. I know Christmas has passed. But the bottom line is this. There you go. A very good. And King is quoted in the book, so it's very appropriate. Or, you know, Lincoln's birthday. I don't care, you know. But it makes a fine holiday gift. But the bottom line is this. We wrote a book about this to point out the absolute absurdity of the system we have constructed. A system where the vote does not matter as much as the dollar. And that, that's the fundamental underpinning of this thing. The, the reality is, unless we intervene, and intervene immediately, not long term, unless we intervene immediately, we run the risk of locking in a system where the only real dynamism from election to election will be the question of how much more was spent in, than the last election. This is not what democracy looks like. It's, voting should be the baseline, the start of a democratic process, not the end of it. And yet, we live in a country where all of our structures militate against democratic participation, militate against a high level of informed voters coming and defining their democratic circumstance. It doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, the only thing I'll say now, and Ian and I'll get deeper into this, is we have to decide that we're not going to make as big a deal of Democrat versus Republican, personality versus personality, and we're going to make a much bigger deal of establishing the structures, establishing a system that ensures high level of democratic participation. And with that high level of democratic participation, if it happens, and I'm not going to make any assumptions about the crowd at the Hammer Museum, but if anybody shares my progressive left-wing views, um, I happen to believe that a high level of participation that actually says and makes real the promise of the vote, which is that the poorest person in the room is the equal of the wealthiest person in the room on the day that they vote, that ultimately because we have done so much to foster income inequality in this country, that when we bring all those people who don't have a lot into the process and we say this process will matter if you make a choice what you choose will be reflected in governance if that's the structure we develop then all the progressive changes that we have wanted that we have known are necessary that we have banged our heads against the wall trying to advance will suddenly become possible but until we address the structural flaws of the american system we can bang our heads against the wall for as long as we want we will still end up with a spectator politics 
low participation, and the ultimate result that somehow, no matter whether his candidate wins or loses, Karl Rove is still smiling on the day after the election. Thank you very much. So, um, Deutschland and Borales, eh? No, not at all. I, you know, <laughs> it's very funny. I, I write, I, I write books. Uh, I, actually, a lot of what I write goes international. And, um, and I spent a lot of my time doing international stuff. And so I actually took that analysis. I just threw out there some of that. And I, I put it into a, a project I was writing for Germany, for a, a German audience. And the editors were like, no, we cannot have that. They literally said, you know, this makes our system sound like it's really good. And we're totally unsatisfied with it. It's not sufficiently good. And so they actually made me not put that in. <laughs> so so let's, let's begin with uh, 2010 that you mentioned was a critical year because uh, one-fifth of the, elec- uh, the electorate has determined our political fate and, yeah, yeah. and basically... Uh, and, it, and it was a redistricting year, so that so as a result, a, they actually a census year, locked so, in. So they've locked in 10 years of gerrymandering. Yeah. And uh, they've obviously tied Obama's hands. My sense of what will happen this year is that it actually may get worse, that the Republicans, that was just their rehearsal. <laughs> 2014, they're going to bring on the pro team. And they uh, uh, have more money... I think more organization. Mm-hmm. They've learned from uh, what happened in 2012, and particularly in, in uh, Ohio. And uh, I don't see any motivation on the Democratic side. Um, and they, so that will mean that we'll have a Republican Senate, Republican House, and a completely lame duck president. What a pretty picture you draw. Well, um, that seems to be because of the whatever advantages came out of the shutdown that were lost by the botched rollout yeah, yeah. of Obamacare, yeah. and there's a torpor out there, and I just don't, I don't see. Uh, anyway, go, well, go ahead. Look, I'm an aficionado of, of Claude Levi Strauss, uh, and so as a result, the, the great anthropologist, and so as a result, I always believe that the golden age is in us, and you never really know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, and so, uh, I'm not. I am. I. It, I, I try desperately to be a pundit, um, but I'm a lousy pundit because I actually don't believe you know until, until it happens, right? And, and so I don't, I don't predict or expect anything from a year. Uh, it, people, it, it, people are very generous to me. They'll say, wow, you, know, you really know your politics and stuff like that. And then I'll say, well, then how come I didn't know that 180,000 people were going to show up outside the Capitol in Madison, Wisconsin, to protest against Scott Walker's abuse? Uh, you know, I didn't know that was going to happen. And I didn't know Occupy was going to develop. And I didn't know that, you know, we were going to be coming into this election cycle with the issue of income inequality actually treated seriously by at least some people. And so all I will suggest to you is that, that unexpected things do happen. And we should be cautious about talking ourselves out of the possibility. All that positive stuff said, yeah, I mean, the Democratic Party could snatch defeat from the jaws of victory in any election cycle. And, and, and I think that they're working very hard this time to do so. Um, look, I think that it's January of an election year. The great tragedy of our politics is this, that what is done early is far more definitional than what is done late. Barack Obama was re-elected president of the United States for a variety of reasons. One, you know, the luck of the draw. How do you get Mitt Romney as your opponent, right? I mean, that's a dream come true, right? You know, and, and how does a guy, how do we, how does, you know, how do we develop these cameras that can videotape somebody talking about 47%? And, you know, I mean, it's a pretty good deal, right? But I will argue that Barack Obama was re-elected president in 2012 because of Occupy. You're like, well, hold it, Occupy. You know, they they were in the park for a couple weeks. What was that about? And yet, here's an interesting thing that Barack Obama did. Uh, for all of his flaws, he went out to Kansas in uh, 2011, and he gave a speech in Kansas that actually embraced a surprising amount of the Occupy rhetoric. Not the not mm-hmm. real policy, but he, you know, he, he recognized he recognized that something was afoot there. That was the Teddy Roosevelt. That was he reprised Teddy Roosevelt's new nationalism speech. Right. And that underpinned the whole of the 2012 re-election campaign. It was very fascinating. I, I, I have, you know, I, did, I wasn't around for Eugene Victor Debs. Um, but I was there on the day before the election when, when Barack Obama gave his 
big reelection speech, right? And I was in Madison, Wisconsin when he got out there, 30,000 people out there. And, and I thought, wow, you know, this is the transfer. This is the radical moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, trust me here. Bruce Springsteen introduces him and sings this great song. We take care of our own. And then Barack Obama gets up there and says, I'm not going to let him attack our Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. We're going to fund education. We're gonna... And I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. This is like unbelievably great. And the interesting thing is the American people actually listen. We don't give them any respect, but they actually listen. And so they heard Barack Obama out there actually saying what they would like to hear. And here's the weird thing that happened in 2012. It's an amazing thing. All sorts of people that they didn't think were going to turn out turned out. Remember, it was supposed to be a really close election. I was doing MSNBC commentary from a union. They always sent me to the union hall. So I was in the Teamsters Hall in, in Toledo, Ohio. And I'm there with my microphone. And you know what they said? They said, you, th before we went on air, they said, you got to find somebody to keep the hall open all night long, because this is going to be an all-nighter. It's going to be the longest night in American politics. Get the chips. Get, get, you know, caffeinated beverages because this thing isn't stopping until 2013. You know? And so we're in the union hall, and the results start coming in. And by, like, 11 o'clock, despite what, Barack, what Karl Rove thought, um, it was over, right? The, the election was clearly decided. And the interesting thing was that our media covers politics so incredibly badly that the next morning they put on Haley Barber, the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, and he said, it was almost a tie. <laughs> and, you know, and it's sort of like, it's like, okay, it was almost a tie. That's like, well, in horse racing, it's almost a tie, but somebody wins. And, but they, they kept banging this, this meme. And then a, a week later, Paul Ryan, who said he went hunting and didn't really follow things after the election, comes back out. He says, well, it's an evenly divided country. But we count ballots so badly in America and so slowly that, that it took us a month to, to figure out. Barack Obama won by five million votes. He had an electoral college landslide. He won every battleground state except North Carolina. He had dramatically higher and better votes in places like Georgia and Alabama than was expected. The Democrats, instead of losing the Senate, as had been expected, uh, improved their circumstance. And in the races for the House of Representatives, Democrats actually got more votes than Republicans. It was only the gerrymandering of the districts that made this not work. In fact, Barack Obama got a higher percentage of the vote in 2012, higher percentage of the vote than Richard Nixon in 68, or Jimmy Carter in 76, or Ronald Reagan in 1980, or Bill Clinton in either of his elections, or George W. Bush. This was a mandate election. There's only one problem. There's only one problem. He went back in, and instead of treating it as a mandate election, instead of you know going for it, he actually gave a relatively good inaugural address. He governed as if he was still not in power. And this is the this is the problem of 2000. Uh, I tell you, the answer to your question is uh, that this is the problem of 2014. If the Democrats run cautious to the center, if they don't make this an economic populist campaign. They will lose very, very badly. Mm -hmm. They still have the possibility, on a messaging standpoint, to do more. But it is a question whether they'll do it. Because I, I wasn't being pessimistic. I was just no, I getting to the point where, where I think the, that uh, unless Obama wins and they pull out all the stops and they treat it like uh, 2016, and of course we're all they're all talking about Hillary and all that nonsense and not realizing that this is, will be the defining election yeah. that's coming up. And, and as your talk just indicated, it's all about uh, the lower the turnout, the better for the Republicans. And if people are not motivated, uh, then, uh, then, the, then we get the results we deserve. And, and I don't see the motivation unless they treat it as, 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 a, as almost as a presidential election. Absolutely. And, and, and every election should be that way. I mean, why do we bother with it if, it's not, if it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right, if we, don't, if we don't go all in? Mm -hmm. and, and yet, on a messaging standpoint, it doesn't. And here's the interesting thing. The, the last time is, well, let me put it another way. I've worked for newspapers all my life, and I worked, at, I worked in the Toledo Blade for a long time, and we hired this British editor, Patty O'Gara. He was actually Irish, but, you know. And he, had come, he came over and he said, 
you were talking about how we do newspapers in America. And he said, you know, this is really weird to me. I've never worked for a newspaper that didn't really want to sell copy. You know, they, like, they put dull stuff on the front page. He was like, no, no, make it in. You know, go all in here. And he'd worked for the Daily Mirror in London. And he said, you should be crusading and doing all this. And he said, no, that's not how we do it in America. We keep it dull. Um, and, and in a weird way, that's how we do politics, too. We, we, I think the last time there was a, pre a Democratic president who actually wanted to win elections and thought that it mattered a lot, um, it was Franklin Roosevelt. And you know, the weird thing about Franklin Roosevelt is he won the on-year elections and the off-year elections. Franklin Roosevelt, this is an interesting thing. Franklin Roosevelt came to power, 1932, after a long period of Republican dominance, and not only did he control the presidency, but he controlled the Congress the entire way through. Never lost it. He had ups and downs, of course. But what did he do? Why? How did that work? Well, the famous election was 1934. Franklin Roosevelt um, he took a train trip across America, and he would be at these events. It was a famous event in Wisconsin, my home state. And there was a left-wing party. There was a political party to the left of the Democrats called the Progressive Party there. There was another in Minnesota, the Farmer Labor Party. There was the American Labor Party in New York. Roosevelt came into these states, and the local Democrats, the hacks, the crooks, the horrible people, right, um, would come and say, hey, Franklin Roosevelt, you're going to endorse us. And Franklin Roosevelt would get on stage, and he would point out the farmer labor people, and he would point out the progressives, and he'd point out the American labor people, and he'd say, you know, I, here's my good friend. Those people, that's really exciting what they're doing. Roosevelt erred to the left. He deferred to a more progressive politics even than his own to excite and engage people. Our Democratic Party, and this is not all about the Democratic Party, I don't want to talk too much about it, but our Democratic Party errs toward the center, toward the dull, toward the disengaging. And if they do that this year, if they do that this year, it will be absolutely disastrous because the American people are not just ready for you know, a 25 cent increase in the minimum wage. The American people are ready for a $15 minimum wage. And they, they, they want big promises and big options. And it was proven up in Seattle in November when Shama Sawant ran for the city council and they said, you don't have a chance. You weren't even born in this country and you are, yes, all this stuff. And you're running as a socialist and you're proposing a $15 minimum wage. You're going nowhere. And that woman was sworn into the city council this week. So we should, we should get to questions. But, but um, some of the stuff that you talked about, let's just quickly go through. Is it, is it practical? Is, I know it's possible, but is it practical? And what are the means by which we can we can rejigger the system from the bottom up with simple mm -hmm. changes like not voting on Tuesdays. That's a good one. When you turn 18, everybody gets automatically registered, not having to do all of that, uh, mm -hmm. all of the, the impediments that they've thrown in, 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 in the way of voting. How can you eliminate them? Because it, it would seem to be not that complicated. I mean, I know we had here in California, there, there was resistance to even motor voter, voter. So you know it's out there, but I would think there's enough smart people and they can, with simple messaging, you could come up with a regime to really, re, uh, you know, you know, revent, you know, American democracy 2.0, you know? Yeah, no, it's a, it, you're exactly right. And that's, that's why I love every place. I took a picture of you folks and I won't, I won't abuse it. Um, you know, but I, all over the, the countries as Bob and I have gone, and, and by the way, we should pay tribute to Bob McChesney. He's a great, in my mind, uh, you know, the greatest thinker we have on media policy. He only has the flu, by the yeah, way. Yeah, he has a bad case of the <laughs> flu. But, um, but uh, you know, Bob and I have gone across the country, and we always have great crowds and these great events all over. And, and the, the thing is that people are ready to fix this thing, but they're not necessarily sure how to do it. And that is the great challenge. And it is because in this country we always default to the partisan politics. We always default to the game of the moment. We don't look for the structural changes that we have to make so that we don't, you know, so that we're not always struggling and always frustrated cycle after cycle. And so I'm going to be very blunt with you. You made it sound pretty easy just changing, you know, like weekend voting and stuff like that. That's, it, it's a little tougher. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to scare you, but we're going to have to amend the Constitution of the United States. You know, we, we have to. Mm -hmm. And we have to do a, a series of amendments to the Constitution of the United States. The first one 
uh, is that we have to say that Antonin Scalia is wrong. In the, in the 2000 Bush v. Gore case, when a lawyer referred to the right to vote, Antonin Scalia stopped him and said, there is no constitutionally defined right to vote in this country. Well, okay, I take my cue from Scalia. We need a constitutionally defined right to vote and a right to have that vote counted. That is, that's a baseline, mm-hmm. and we ought to build movements around that. doesn't mean we have to get it. We're going to get it in the next day, but that's something that we should be very confident of saying that's what we're for. We need a constitutional amendment to say money is not speech, corporations are not people, and citizens have a right to organize elections that, that will be reflective of democracy. And while we're at it, look, I'm going to go nuts here. I'm going to say we should also get rid of the Electoral College so that losers of presidential elections actually can't become president. And finally, we should bar gerrymandering so that, that at the end of the day, every district is competitive. Okay. Now, I well, know what you're saying. I know. No, actually, you're, you're sounding like you're talking about having a constitutional convention. No, 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 no. These are simple, quick, quick hit things. You know. Yeah. Um, because, see, this is the interesting thing. I, I'm not talking about constitutional convention, although I, I'm not. But I'm all, like, it, that, you open up everything at the constitutional I'm convention. I'm like Gorbadal. I'm not sure it's such a terrible idea, but, but I'm not, this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing, this is the interesting thing, because this is the fun part. I'm talking about what we've done every time we've had democracy problems in America in the past. See, we don't, we don't teach history in this country. And history is the empowering, it's a, it's a great empowering tool. And um, the interesting thing is that at every great, crisis moment in this country, whenever we've had a big, big challenge, we have responded with multiple constitutional changes which were designed to actually make the system work. After the Civil War, you know, did you ever see, anybody see the movie Lincoln, right? What were they talking about in the movie Lincoln? Constitutional amendments to make real the sacrifice that they had made so that you lock in the progress that you have hopefully achieved. After the Civil War, you did three constitutional amendments. Right? Interesting thing. That's not the only time we did multiple constitutional amendments. In the 1960s, we did multiple constitutional amendments. And again, we don't teach history that way. But the 1960s started with banning the poll tax. We said you, don't have to, you can't have an economic barrier to voting. The 1960s ended with giving 18 to 21-year-olds the right to vote. In the midst of that, we actually restructured some presidential stuff, too. I mean, we, this is not uncommon. But I'll give you one example of what I'm talking about here. This is the big deal stuff. Because to get the, the little things, like changing election day, and you know, we have to build a democracy movement in this country that has great big goals that can excite the hell out of people, right? So that they, they think, okay, I'm gonna, I, you're asking a lot, but at the end of this, if we win, we actually get something big out of this, not, not a little bit of tinkering around the edges. And, and in 1910, if you were born in the United States, or let's say you're old enough to look around this country, you looked across the great fertile plain of the United States, this is what you saw. A country where little girls came down the front steps of their, their apartment or their home that they lived in, uh, and they weren't heading for school. Even though they were you know, six, seven, eight years old, they were heading to a mill where they worked because little girls worked as bobbin girls. They had tiny fingers, and as a result, they could reach into the machinery in the mills and change the bobbins and do the technical work that adults could not do. And also that because it was such dangerous work, if adults were injured, you lost a worker, whereas if a kid was injured, it was just a kid. And so those little girls would reach into the machines, and sometimes the machine would start, and it would cut their finger off or their hand. And that was okay because it was a gilded age. And uh, the people who owned the factories got to write the rules. They, did not, you didn't, they didn't have to defer to a government or to regulation in most places. And if those little girls grew up, they would go to work in a, maybe a textile uh, mill or maybe a, a, a clothing factory. Maybe in a big city like New York, they would work on the 10th, 11th floor of a building. And they would work with all sorts of other young women, uh, African-American women who had come from the South, Italians, uh, Irish immigrants, Germans, uh, Muslims, Jews, Christians, all in this room, all working together, talking about their dreams, talking about their possibilities. And when, the, when that, that building caught on fire, they would run to the door, and they were, these are strong young women. They were ready to run the 11th floors to safety, but they would find the door locked shut so that young women working there would not steal a bathroom break during their 10, 11, 12, 14-hour working day. And so those young women had to make their choice. Would they burn alive, or would they jump to their deaths? And when the families of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire workers came to collect the bodies, they found their sisters and their mothers and their daughters 
spread across the streets of New York City. This is not Bangladesh. This was America 100 years ago. And those women could not vote. They had no right to, to define the politics of their country. And if they could vote, they couldn't elect their Congress because the upper chamber of the Congress, the US Senate, was appointed, not elected, chosen in backroom deals with the express purpose of making sure that democracy would not define our politics. And if they did get an elected Congress, they couldn't define the tax policies or the structural regulatory policies of this country because we didn't allow that. That was 1910. In 1920, women had the right to vote. We had an elected United States Senate. And we had created a tax system that allowed us to tax the rich and tax corporations in a 10-year period. And out of that grew child labor laws, protections for women in the workplace, the beginnings, the underpinnings of a labor movement that actually had had thrust and power, and really the basis of what would become the New Deal. Ten-year period that was done. Why? Because we talked about that new nationalism speech. Because people just decided they weren't going to go and collect their daughters' bodies on the street anymore. That they were going to actually change the system, and they were not satisfied with tinkering around the edges. Everything I just discussed, right to vote for women, the elected Senate, the tax policy, change of our tax policy, all came as a result of constitutional amendments. Multiple constitutional amendments in a 10-year period. We should ask ourselves a simple question. Are we the equivalent of our grandparents and our great-grandparents? Can we go do the same? Because if we can't, then we have, we have given up the franchise. We have given up the power to fix this thing. Because this moment demands multiple constitutional amendments and the movement to do it, even if we don't get all of them, we need a movement muscular enough that begins to talk about the structural repairs of our system, the structural functioning of our system, not merely tinkering around the edges. Oh, very good. Um, let's, let's take questions. She asked, when am I running for office? The fact that I'm saying these things tells you that I'm not running for office, right? <laughs> you know, the, the fact, this is the interesting thing. Um, because I was so involved in the Wisconsin struggle, I had tons of people say to me, well, you should run. You should run for office. The fact is I have far too much respect for people who do run for office to, to think that I could do it. It's, the, the truth of the matter is that, that in my mind, and I'm very serious about this, in my mind the most important thing is the ideas. The most important thing is these structural changes. Uh, holding power for anybody, and I'd love to put Ian in public office. I'd love to put all of you in public offices. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is we don't need an individual leader at this point. What we desperately need is a movement. And the fact is, I come to report to you that the movement is already here. If we had a media in this country that covered politics, not elections, but politics, we would know that 16 American states have already petitioned Congress to overturn the Citizens United ruling and have formally asked for a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics. We would know we would know that more than 500 communities have joined Los Angeles to demand a constitutional amendment to formally get money out of our politics. We would know that Congressman Keith Ellison and Congressman Mark Pocan have introduced a right to vote and a right to have your vote counted amendment to the Constitution of the United States and Color of Change and other civil rights groups have thrown in to support that and to this year build a national movement saying, we don't just need to restore the Voting Rights Act, we need voting rights for everyone in this country. This movement is real, it is happening, but we have such a lousy media system that we don't know it's there. I want to tell you, it is there, it is happening. You don't have to recreate the wheel. What you do have to do is, instead of suggesting I should run for office, which is very nice of you, um, what you have to do is say that you're more important than me. You doing this struggle and challenging the people who are in office is far more important than, than somebody individual making the run. You're right. It's the movement. But I think we have some movement problems. And we know the Electoral College is out of date. but well, it's going to be real in the next election, and we're going to have to function under that. So. Shouldn't shrewdness become a progressive value? Shouldn't we be building coalitions better? Rather than just blame the leaders, 
why don't we, well, not blame, but criticize ourselves for not doing our job adequately? And I'd like you to comment on that. Well, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it, the fact is I'm pretty satisfied with, with activists across this country. I'm very impressed. You know, we went, we did, uh, we went to roughly 40 cities on the book tour uh, last fall. We never went to any place where there weren't people there with their petitions and they're, you know, actually doing the work of it. And, you know, you guys voted last year on, a, on an amendment referendum here in Los Angeles. And despite the fact that the Los Angeles Times told you it was a horrible thing and you shouldn't do it, 73% of you said, well, we'll think for ourselves. And you voted in favor of it. So the fact is that uh, I think that what you're getting at is an important thing. Our great challenge in the United States at this point is that our progressive movements, for all of their good talk, when it gets toward an election, they get so wrapped up in the, the election of the moment that they don't continue to make the, that tougher demand. And all I can suggest to you is that, that sometimes, that if we're to make the structural changes that we need to make, and they are so necessary, then we gotta make movements that are stronger than parties and stronger than individuals. And this is a very big deal. It's hard to do because we have funding mechanisms, we have all sorts of structural mechanisms around our movements that actually encourage them to be a little more deferent to the parties, to deferent to politics, uh, electoral politics, than is healthy. Here's the antithesis of that. Take a look at the 1912 election, 100 years ago. We just had the 2012 election. In 1912 in this country, it was a four-way four presidential race. And the four candidates were President William Howard Taft, who was a Republican, uh, Democrat Woodrow Wilson, former President Teddy Roosevelt, and Eugene Victor Debs, socialist. a socialist. And Eugene Victor Debs got 6% of the vote. I mean, that, that, that is a substantial vote. But the interesting thing was that, that if you read the platforms of all four of those candidates, they were closer to one another then than they are to the Democratic Party today. The fact is the Republicans in 1912, the most conservative of the major parties, was saying we need progressive change in this country. We need to do all sorts of big things. Why was that? Because at that time, we had a incredibly active industrial workers of the world in IWW. We had a socialist party that was real and that was organized in places across this country. We had radical progressive reformers who were active all over. And we had an independent media system that had developed all across this country that, that literally practiced a muckraking journalism that saw as its purpose comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. And the fact of the matter is, you need that. That's what we desperately need. We need a politics that makes whatever political parties step forward deflect to or re reference to the movement, not a, not a movement that deflects to or references to the existing politics. And to get to that, I, I wish I could tell you that, that it's really easy and we just got to you know, get George Soros to write a check or something like that. No, it doesn't work that way. It's got to be real, and it's got to be every one of you. It's got to be literally people saying, I'm, this is going to be my day. This is going to be a part of what I do. I don't want you to work 24-7. I want you to go and listen to music and read good books and eat good food and do all the things that, that make you happy. But, you know, give me 5%. You know, give me, give me a chunk of time and an investment in democracy. And if we do that, we can change the thing. But if we don't do that, if we don't do that, I guarantee you we will give our children and our grandchildren a country that is so fiercely dysfunctional, so unattractive, that, uh, that we, will, we will be ashamed. We will literally be ashamed. That's, that's my downer moment. Well, I like the idea, though, of, of, of having a, a contemporary Mark Twain and a contemporary Ida Tarbell. Yeah. I mean, the... And we sort of do, because... Although she's Canadian, we have Naomi Klein, and we've got Jeremy Scahill. There you go. Okay. And there you go. You mentioned um, in a positive way that Germany has Not multiple. I, oh yeah, there you are. That okay. has multiple parties. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, right, the U.S. is something called 
plurality voting, which I'm sure you're aware of. Oh, yeah. um, it seems to me that, that what we need here is um, multiple parties and the way that they can be effective is to change our plurality voting system to either approval voting or instant runoff voting. Mm -hmm. These are real structural changes that you've been mm -hmm. emphasizing that would make our society so much more democratic. Um, multiple parties and either s approval voting or instant runoff voting to go along with multiple parties. I'm with you, brother. And you see, this is, watch a transformation that is going on in this room. We started out with, we got a crisis. Things aren't as good as they, as they are, you know. Ian wants us all to move to Australia, you know. And, you know, and, and it's a nightmare scenario. Uh, and, and, and then we start talking about some big ideas, and a couple of people channel and say, well, yeah, but what about this, stuff like that. And suddenly we're at the point of people saying, well, here's the reform I think we should put in the mix. This is what we need to do in every room across this country. We need to take the discussion about the crisis, about the frustration. We need to take those big kind of unsettling ideas, put them out there, and then we need to open it up and start to bring in, a, to, to do a real discussion about what we might want this system to be. And, and what I, the way that I refer to it is, is, is as a constant refounding moment. And this is an important thing. It, it may come as a shock to some people in the room that the Constitution was not written in stone and handed down to Michelle Bachman. The Constitution of the United States was drafted by people who knew they were incredibly imperfect. I mean, many of them were slave owners. And they knew they were wrong. Uh, but they were, too, they were too lazy, frankly, to, to give up the economic advantage that they had to self-serving. And so the fact of the matter is that our constitutional experiment was created to be improved, to be constantly refined. And it, when Thomas Jefferson said the tree of liberty should be watered every 20 years with the blood of patriots, he wasn't and, trying... And tyrants. What? Uh, and tyrants. And tyrants. Yeah, well, get the tyrant in. But the patriots had to put the blood in too, right? Well, you know? I, think, you're I like, can think of a few tyrants that yeah. I'd like to see bleed. <laughs> but can I just tell you, when Jefferson said that, you know, it wasn't like he was scoping out some scenario for a horror film, right? He was... In fact, he wasn't even talking about actual blood. He was saying, no, on a regular basis... We need to renew this thing. We have to you know, constantly repair and change this thing. Tom Paine said the worst thing that one generation could do was to hand the next generation a constitution and say that you must live under the rules that we wrote, that the, only the living get to define their country, not the dead, and that if we hand our constitution down generation after generation after generation and say that we cannot change it, then we will live under the rules of 100 or 200 years ago, we will take all their pathologies and never have human progress. Historically, in this country, we've rejected that notion. We have amended our Constitution on a regular basis to fix and repair and improve and move forward the country. We are now living in one of the rare circumstances where we have literally gone for a very long time without a serious progressive constitutional reform movement. And the fact of the matter is, it's time. The fact is, it's time to fix the thing. Hi, I uh, so appreciate uh, John Nichols, you being here. I am a socialist, and I'm glad that you mentioned Sharma. Um, so on. So on. Yeah. That was just uh, elected in uh, Seattle, Washington. It is a remarkable election. Um, I want everybody to be educated in this room. And I appreciate that you tried to educate me and everybody with your writings whenever I hear you on air. Um, but like you said, it's exemplary what you're saying because um, I know that the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights is violated in this country daily since no third party, aside from the two-party dictatorship, political dictatorship that we have, Democrats or Republicans, are allowed to debate in the public forum. So the question for you is, I want your comment, and how do you feel about precisely, you said, eliminating the Electoral College, but then you've got other issues tied into that. Um, I want this to be immediately abolished so that everybody, A, B, C, D, and Z, can be sitting where you are debating so that all of us who are voting 
can hear A, B, C, D, N, C, mm-hmm. see which is the best one that represents me. I love what. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that very good question. And here's here's a, a quick response to it because I know we've got other questions as well. But I think this is such an important thing. The fact of the matter is that Americans are unconscious of the fact, except for very very old people. And I love really old people. No, you're not old enough. I mean, I'm talking about. I like really old people, like 95 year olds, and and those are my. That's my crew. And you know, I was. I was blessed for many years to be friends with Frank Zeidler, the last socialist mayor of a major American city. And Frank was the mayor of Milwaukee, Wisconsin from 1948 to 1960. And when he got done being mayor, he packed up his desk, went out, and was waiting for the bus to go home because he felt that, that a socialist took the bus. And, um, and Frank did go home, and then he lived another 46 years after he was mayor. And so I got to hang out a lot with Frank. And, um, and you know what the best thing about Frank was? He would always say, you know, it used to be different. And this is a really power, there's no more powerful statement than it used to be different, both for good and bad. Like Frank was against privatization and stuff because he said, he says, I remember when we made it public, right? Because the private companies gave us dirty, polluted water, so we created a public water system. And so he had these, this great consciousness. But one of the things that was really, that's really important is to understand that there's nothing new about Shama Sawant in Seattle. In 1910, uh, socialists won the mayoralty of Milwaukee, and, and in nine, that same year, they sent a socialist to the U.S. Congress. We've had many times in this history where we've had a number of socialists sitting in the U.S. Congress being the, the main opposition party in state legislatures. Hundreds of communities in this country have had socialists as mayors and city council members and school board members. It's part of our history. Multi-party politics is a part of our history. And in writing, I wrote a book called The S Word, which is, it was a, a history of socialism in America. And, um, and the interesting thing was that I got to actually, I did, real, I did real-time research. I didn't just you know, read other people's books. I went back and I looked at the archives of the New York Times. And uh, one of the most fascinating things was that in 1932, when Norman Thomas ran for president of the United States as a socialist candidate, um, the New York Times had a reporter assigned to him full-time. Every rally he did was reported in the paper. And this is a big deal because the fact of the matter is that in America, if you don't tell people they have alternatives, they don't think they have alternatives. And, and the fact, here's the other fact of it. They covered Norman Thomas in 1932, and after the 1932 election, you know who had a meeting with Norman Thomas in December of 1932? Franklin Roosevelt. Because Franklin Roosevelt said, you had some pretty good ideas out there, Norman. I want to, you know, let's talk about this. And, and this is, when we expand our political process out, when we bring more parties in, that's a healthy thing. And it's not just socialists. It's also libertarians. You know, the fact of the matter is, in Virginia, in Virginia, the libertarian candidate this year got 6 7% of the vote. It was a very substantial vote. And it was very interesting, you know, how he appealed and who he appealed to. And so what we need to do is open this process up. And the best way to look at it is that I would begin by one thing that is not a constitutional reform. It is simply just the easy right thing to do. And that is to forever banish from the earth the Commission on Presidential Debates. (laughs) Uh, Which was created, the Commission on Presidential Debates was created in 1988 because we had had some interesting presidential elections. And so the chairmen of the Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee got together and created the Commission on Presidential Debates to make sure that we would never again have an interesting election. Right, and they they aced out the League of Women Voters. They did. They they got rid of the the nice ladies who actually put together good debates and, and, and had rules that were actually structurally relatively sound. And all I would tell you is the Commission on Presidential Debates is an absolutely horrible, destructive institution that seeks to make sure that, that our debates are awful and, and dysfunctional. And as, and as an alternative, I would only offer you this, France. In France, they have, they have presidential elections, and they're big deal presidential elections. Uh, they have a, a two-cycle election so that you get to you know, initially vote for who you want and then, then have an American election between people you don't want. And, uh, but when they have their initial election in France, anybody who qualifies to be on the national ballot is in the debate. 
And so they have these incredible debates. I, I, I encourage you to YouTube it. They have debates where there are like nine candidates on the stage, and they will have a postal worker and a bank clerk. Wow. And like real people. And you know what happens? They got this guy called the Red Postman. He's a, he's a Marxist postal worker. And he's very charming, and he got like 5% of the vote. And, and the, the, the point of it is, is this is a weird thing. Having multi-candidate politics doesn't necessarily fix everything. France still ends up with lousy presidents. But, the, but opening it up does a very interesting thing. And I'll close off. I know I, I love telling these stories so much that, that they can go on for a while. But this is the interesting thing that happened in France in 2012. I hope I've got the cycle right. I think I do. Um, they had a presidential election. And there was a guy named Jean-Luc Mélenchon, you know. And, and he was a, a, a real socialist, like a rip-roaring fun socialist, like, he, like red scarf kind of guy. And so Mélenchon goes, it's out there. And he's running for president. And, and he has these rip-roaring fabulous rallies. Again, I invite you to YouTube them. Because they would get like 60, 70, 80,000 people. And they rocked. It was fun. And it was like Nader's super rallies, you know, and stuff like that. So anyway, bottom line is that that he was pretty exciting. And and one of the things that he did was when the when the um, the the rating services downgraded France's credit rating, which they did to America. You know, they they do this to countries, right? Instead of you know like, in the American response is well, that wasn't very nice, you know. Um, Melancon pulled a truck up in front of the rating agency's office, right? And it was in a relatively narrow street in Paris. And they got like 8,000 people in the street with bricks. And, and it was a very, very raucous rally in which they, Melancon said, you know, you, can't, you don't have a right to downgrade our country. We get to decide who we are. You don't tell us what our credit rating is. You know, he pushed back. And here's the interesting thing. This is the interesting thing. The mainstream you know, social democratic candidates you know, who eventually hold on to who became president, um, he, he started, saying, started sounding a little more radical because there was this guy with a truck in front of the rating service. And it was, you know, and, and so ideas started to bubble up from the left into that. And then at the end of the cycle, Sarkozy, the conservative president of France, was saying, maybe we should have a Robin Hood tax, a financial speculation tax on big corporations. And you're sort of like, well, how did that happen? Well, how that happened was you had multi-candidate politics where ideas actually bubbled up as opposed to just this boring, narrow thing. So yes is the answer to your question. <laughs> well, I'm getting old because I remember, and maybe you don't, uh, John, that no. they, we used to have a, debates like that before the FCC was changed by Reagan, I believe. Yes. And we used to have all the par the parties used to you had be a on the doctor. stage. Yeah, yeah. Right, and I remember when I was a kid watching and saying, why are we wasting time with all these strange people? Because I was young and I didn't understand how important it was. So I want you to, can you comment on that? No, your point that? is exactly right. I won't have to belabor it too far. But the fact of the matter is, we have, somebody's calling in to confirm your point. <laughs> and, um, but it's definitely ringing. There's no doubt about it. Um, but, we have constrained and narrowed our politics, not expanded it. We have made our politics less functional, not more functional, in, over recent. Uh, I think we have an important call coming in here, so I want to make sure that. Um, but, but this is a big deal, and it's an important thing to understand about the American, American political process. It, we now have less of a competition in this country, less of a diverse politics than we had um, 40 years ago. And I invite you to, invite you to understand or recognize, I'm so interested in this conversation, that I'm, I'm, you know, being drawn away from it. But, um, but I, I invite you to understand this, to, to imagine this possibility. In 1968, Lyndon Johnson was an unsatisfying Democratic president of the United States. Now, in hindsight, you know, he started a war on poverty. It sounds like a pretty, you know, it doesn't sound as bad in hindsight. But at the time, people were very unsatisfied with him. And multiple candidates mounted primary challenges to the sitting president of the United States. Uh, it was just what you did. And today, we haven't had a, a sitting president of the United States seriously challenged, seriously challenged for his nomination since Pat Buchanan ran against George. What? Yeah, but that's 1980. You know, I mean, I'm sorry. 
that was a while ago. You know, <laughs> and the fact of the matter is that that you know we we have we have created a structure now where we've returned to the Gilded Age. We've returned to the politics where bosses in the back room now they are called you know finance chairs. You know, but bosses in the back room sit around and decide who the candidates will be and what the range of debate will be. It is an absolutely broken and dysfunctional politics. Now, that does not mean that in an election between Ted Cruz and Barack Obama, you wouldn't necessarily go vote because you think, well, being run by a Canadian, no, that's not what we want. And, and, and so, but, but it is important to understand that we've got to learn to wear two hats. We can vote in elections and have our choices and have you know, the marginally better candidate, but we shouldn't accept that as our ultimate reality. We should, we should vote in our elections, but we should also say we don't want more elections like this. We want to fix this thing and make it fundamentally different. And you know, this is, I know how easy it is to be in a room like this and you know, have these ideas float around and to think it's just an intellectual exercise. It is not just an intellectual exercise. There are people who get up early in the morning and go out and knock on doors. I live in Dane County, Wisconsin. They filed the, the petitions for the local elections in April uh, on Tuesday. And the people in Belleville, Wisconsin, home of the UFO parade, uh, <laughs> filed their petition to put on their local village ballot on April 4th or 5th a a message to their member of Congress that Belleville says, amend the Constitution, overturn Citizens United. That's a little town of about 2,000 people, but they thought it was important enough to go out and do it, and they petitioned it on the ballot. Who are we in a great hall in the Billy Wilder Theater in Los Angeles, California, to say they're wasting their time? Who are we to say, oh, that's just an intellectual exercise? Wrong. If the farmers and the shopkeepers in Belleville, Wisconsin are willing to go and fight this fight, then I think people who are very, very privileged, frankly, to be a part of the great discussions, to live in exciting places, to be, hang out with Ian Masters, you know, we ought to follow them and go out okay. and fight the fight as well. well we, <clears throat> I, I think we only have time for one more question, and, and, and John is gonna be signing Dollarocracy in, up there in the lobby. So let's, this gentleman in the second row here, sure. and then, and then uh, we'll, uh, John will be up there in a minute. Uh, thank you. I'm proud to say I am um, the son of a Maltese woman. But, uh, wow, fantastic. <laughs> uh, I bet I, she always votes. I, I don't know how you can mention Johnson in 68 without mentioning Vietnam. Yeah. I think that had a lot to do with it. But my question to you is, it seems that a lot of the obstacles being thrown in front of the progressive movement come from states. And how are the uh, sort of campaign finance and money infecting and in fact poisoning yeah. some of the state politics going on out there, particularly in the southern region? Okay. The states control the elections. I swear I didn't set this guy up for this yeah. fantastic question, but thanks my brother. Um, <laughs> and, and my Maltese brother. Um, but here's the, here's the bottom line. America has the most ridiculous election system in the world. I mean, really ridiculous. Because what we say is that we're electing a federal government, right? We're electing a government in Washington with a president and members of Congress. And I swear every time I bring that up, the calls come in. <laughs> you know? But we're electing this Congress that's going to govern the whole country. But we're going to let every single state write its own rules for how we do it. And we're actually going to let subdivisions within the states write different rules from different places so that your vote actually counts more in one county than the next county. I wrote this book about the 2000 election in Florida and I actually went down and spent a lot of time there. And I titled it Jews for Buchanan um, because, because to believe that George Bush was elected president in 2000, you have to believe that elderly garment workers from New York City who had come from a great trade union background, as well as Holocaust survivors, voted for Pat Buchanan uh, because he got this substantial vote out of like one of the most Jewish counties in America. This is an absurdity. This is a totally broken election. 
And one of the most broken things was up in North Florida on the Panhandle, where in one county, the county around Tallahassee, they had one ballot, less than one ballot per 100 discarded. Like it screwed up in some way. You overvoted, voted for two offices, you undervoted, you didn't fill it. But one, less than one per 100 was tossed. In the next county over, it was one in eight, right? The next county, because they had different ballot design. In the Tallahassee County, right, the ballot was a simple ballot. Like, you know, in the next county over, I swear, unbelievable, Gadsden County, they had, two, they had two ballot pages, right? So they had, the, they had seven of the candidates on one page and three of them on the other for president. And then they had a sign in all the polling places that said, vote each ballot. And 1,200 people in Gadsden County cast a vote on the first ballot and a cast, on, a cast a vote on the second ballot. And here's the interesting thing. Gadsden County is the only majority minority county in Florida, Minor, majority African-American county. And Al Gore swept that county. And that pile of discarded ballots, which people did what they were told to do, that pile of discarded ballots was overwhelmingly people who on the first page had voted for Al Gore. The fact of the matter is structural flaws how, the dysfunctional way in which we screw up our election process, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, creates results. And I, I had the privilege of covering South African elections in the transition from apartheid to democracy. And the first thing they did was they created a national election system where the rules were the same everywhere. So you can't possibly do it any other way. But we don't do that in America. And so, when we talk about this, this dysfunction in the states, that's rooted in a flawed system. We should not have 50 different sets of rules for how we, we hold elections. And we got around that a little bit with the Voting Rights Act, right? We said the Voting Rights Act would allow the federal government to tell states that it actually you know, structurally denied people the right to vote, that they can't do that, right? And we would, now the Supreme Court has said, oh, we don't, we don't like that anymore because we've gotten rid of all those problems in America. <laughs> well, but I actually, I'm sort of happy for the Supreme Court in, that, in one regard. It drove home the fact that we have this incredibly dysfunctional and ridiculous system. And this is why in our book, we don't close the book off with the call for the Citizens United Amendment, which we think, which is actually much further along and I think well on its way to, to getting the traction it will ultimately need. Um, instead, we, we say that the much more important amendment, the place, where we, the place of beginning, must be a guaranteed right to vote and a right to have that vote counted. And once we have constitutionally guaranteed the right to vote, then you cannot have an inconsistent system across this country, different rules in different places. Now, I know you're going to say, well, yeah, but I don't have the time to wait. You know, I mean, it's a pretty messed up system right now. My answer to that is, this is why we make the demand. If we make the demand for a constitutional right to vote and to have it counted, then yes, it may be a long time before we get that. Constitutional amendments take time. But we have put on the table a discussion about our inconsistent and, frank, and again, dysfunctional way of holding elections and counting votes. And this is what we have to do. You know, we, we've got to get away from simply getting mad at Republicans when they do a voter ID law or when they change the polling places or when they get rid of same day registration. And it, you know, yeah, we can be mad at them for that, but we should be even madder at a structure that allows them to do that. We shouldn't allow Democrats to screw up elections. We shouldn't allow Republicans to screw up elections. We ought to have a system in this country that says that the elections themselves are structured to encourage democracy. And then we'll sort the rest of it out. Let me close with this just one quick thought. The fact of the matter is that in this room, if this was 1790, I would venture to say that maybe one or two of you would have been allowed to vote, a tiny number of you, you know, because we didn't allow people of color to vote, we didn't allow women to vote, we didn't allow white guys, you know, and, and I mean really, discrimination against white guys, what the heck? Um, but we didn't allow white guys who didn't own property to vote. We didn't allow religious dissenters to vote. And so at the end of the day, we X just about everybody out of the process. 
But the founding of the American experiment, everybody was interested in elections. And so when they had an election, it would be in a small room and maybe like 50, 60 planters or businessmen would gather to elect a member of Congress. But if it was in a southern state, they would often open the windows, you know, and all the people, the slaves, the women, the non-propertied white guys, they would all gather outside and look in and watch the, the process to see who would represent them and make the laws for them. What I would suggest to you is we're moving very rapidly toward a system where, again, they throw the windows open and they let us watch the structures, the, the image of an election. But we, we aren't defining the process. We aren't defining the issues that are in play. And when the votes are counted, our choices are not reflected in the governance of the country. That's a dollarocracy. That's a place where wealth and power defines the process. And most of us are spectators. Every question we ask about elections, every question we ask about politics ought to be, how do we throw open the doors and let everybody into that room rather than having most of us look in through the window and see politics as a spectator sport? This is too important to be a spectator sport. This ought to be a participatory sport, and we all ought to be a part of it. Thank you very much.